Uh, good morning. Uh, it's my pleasure this morning to introduce Dr. Gerhard Weber uh, of the division. Um, I'm a fill-in for poor Dr. Stout, who's the normally loquacious Dr. Stout, who's out with laryngitis. Must be torture. Uh, we wish her a speedy recovery. So uh, Gerhard uh, went to uh, undergraduate in Munster, in Germany, and uh, received his MD, PhD from Yale. He then uh, did internal medicine training at University of Hanover, in internal medicine training at University of Hanover, and then came to the United States to work for four years in Leonard Zahn's lab at the Brigham, uh, followed by uh, uh, in internship and residency at the Brigham uh, and uh, then cardiology fellowship at Yale. He then worked for three years in Helen Blau's lab at Yale before coming to the University of Washington. He's been a huge part of our overnight coverage in the CCU and now also, atten now also attends uh, at, uh, at Harborview as well. Um, he has uh, 28 publications uh, and a book chapter. Does that sound about right? Something like that. In uh, journals such as uh, Blood, Nature, and PNAS. Uh, so he's going to speak with us today about temperature drives cardiac function. Thank you, Gerhard. Thank you, Kevin. Good morning, everyone. So just this crowd. Um, yeah, let's talk about um, let's talk about something we talk about a lot. Um, but I'm trying to make a point that we're missing a major part of what we usually talk about in, in the hospital. Uh, disclosure slide, so I have nothing to disclose. So quick outline of the talk. So cardiac output, there it is. Um, you're like, well, we've heard this before. Um, but I would try to make the point that Frank Starling, which is you know something which we hear about, and we teach a lot, uh, is only half the story. And the other half, we're gonna talk about today. Um, they're gonna show some experimental data and then also some large scale clinical data, hot off the press. And then we're gonna dive into the, the world without pre and after load and without diastolic filling. And then the overall question, obviously, we're gonna conclude with what does this all mean at the end? So, all right, so I, I don't have to explain this to anyone here. Um, stroke volume times heart rate gives cardiac output. No further comment needed. Um, they are not independent though, because there are many cases where um, the stroke volume and the heart rate change both at the same time. And that's often the case, or most often the case. Um, for example, systolic heart failure is the classic case that we all encounter every day, where the stroke volume is low by, by definition. Um, but if, they, if the patient shows up in your clinic for the first time, your, the baseline heart rate is going to be elevated. So there is say, some correlation. And then you take the, the athlete's heart, which is the opposite, right? So he shows up in your clinic, a um, little enlarged chamber high stroke volume, but the heart rate is low, right? They, they often, you know, they show up and have a resting heart rate in the 40s. So again, like there's a change on one, but also a simultaneous change in, in the other. So this is stroke volume. And we know how to, how to manipulate stroke volume. And, and you know, Frank and starting. So these are the, the two. Uh, Frank, uh, Otto Frank was a German scientist. Frank Starling, sorry, Ernest Starling. Uh, was a, a British scientist. Um, they all came up with this, you know, stretch and preload have, that has an effect on, on the stroke volume. So this is what we usually teach. Every medical student in, in the second year and so on will know this. So, you, you know, your preload goes a little bit up and then you just have this, this curve where the stroke volume increases and at some point it's going to fall off if you stretch too much. So heart rate, right? So this is the other half of the, of the equation, the heart rate. 50% of the equation is right there. Um, so what happens to the heart rate if you, if you change the preload? No one knows. <laughs> so I did, a, you know, a, a, a med search and everything. There's really not much out there. It always, it always goes back to the preload and the, and the stroke volume, but you know, it, there's really nothing 
in terms of heart rate. So you could you could you could come up with a new law, the X heart rate law. Um, and it could go, so if you if you put this down here as a if you put the preload down there, it could go either way, right? It could go up the same way the stroke volume goes up, could be stay stable or even go down. So if it went down, then you would have a problem. If you increase the preload, your stroke volume goes up, but at the same time your heart rate lowers, but then you wouldn't gain anything, right? So that's a problem. And no one knows. So it, which which baffles me because it's like one of the classic relationships we teach, but we're obviously missing half of the story. So what, what is this? So they, if we think heart rate and stroke volume are related, so then we can do a little detective work. So let's, you know, and now we can, anyone can shout in, and Shinonzo might actually know this already. Um, so, but if you, if anyone, so if you want to increase my heart rate, it doesn't have to be medications, it doesn't have to be drugs, but what would you make me do if you want to increase my heart rate? Anything is 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 a lot. Put you in front of an audience. For example. Yeah. Exercise. <laughs> maybe. Maybe. Okay. So I've I've run this this exercise many times. Exercise, no, no pun intended. Um, many times, you know, with the with the residents. And it, we came up with a list. So this is like part of the list. An exercise, right? So is there psychological stress, uh, stress as, as Kevin mentioned, medications, drugs, hormones. Is, does that sound like a reasonable list? I mean, I'm, is part of, you know, a little biased, but I mean, this is what I got like over years from, you know, when, when I just collected the answers. And so it's, it looks like a pretty good garden variety list, but it's not. Um, if you look at it, there's a common denominator um, among those. I'm not saying this is an exhaustive list, but you know, among these factors, there is something that might stand out. Um, and I think it's, if you if you take the exercise and fever, and then the thyroid hormones, I think it, you might get an idea where I'm hinting at, which is all of those seem to be. Um, you know, changing the metabolism. I mean, T3, T4, thyroid hormone is the poster child. That's easy to, I mean, and exercise the same thing. So obviously they all increase your metabolism in terms of beta blockers, the opposite. So they're, they're kind of metabolic modulators. All right, okay, well, fine. So what are we gonna do with this? And then, so let's ask the question if people have looked at this um, and people have. So 1912, so now we go back hundreds of years, not hundreds, but hundred years, a little more than that. And interestingly, so the same group, Starling, he, he is it again. So this time he, it's not the law, but stroke volume, but it's about heart rate. And they looked at this. So, you know, those are the golden, the golden days of, of cardiac physiology, if you would like to, to state it that way. So they looked, so what happens you know, if you change the metabolism and, and read out the heart rate. So they didn't have 1912. They didn't have all the fancy drugs. They didn't have inotropes yet. They didn't have calcium channel blockers. They didn't have beta blockers yet, but they could do, um, they could externally change the, the metabolic environment. So what they did, they just took a dog heart, uh, hooked it up to the perfusion and changed the temperature. So that's a metabolic manipulation. No drugs, but you, you change the metabolic environment. And this is what they found. So you change the temperature of the perfusate, makes it warmer, and the heart rate goes up. Where well, you would say, well, that's not, I mean, of course it does. You know, it gets warmer. But it goes up in a very linear fashion. It goes up exactly the same way you increase the temperature. So if you increase the temperature, for example, by five degrees or like one degree, the heartbeat goes up by five. If you increase it by another degree, it goes up another five and so on. So it's a very linear ratio until a very, you know, until like 41, 42 degrees, um, and then it drops off. So the summary is here. So the rate of the isolated heart is determined entirely by temperature. And it's unaltered by changes in arterial resistance or venous pressures. Um, and as I said, like the heart's relation, heart rate relation is with temperature is exactly a straight line. 
And now this is important too. So they found this too already. So within why it limits the output of the heart, so which the cardiac output is independent of the arterial resistance and temperature. So you're getting a, a taste already where this is going to go. So the heart rate goes up, but not everything else. All right, so let's move from, from dogs to humans. Um, so Sunday at Harborview, I was on the consult service. Everyone knows this. <laughs> Everyone has been there. And the, the CQ pages me <laughs> with, a, with, a, <laughs> with a consult request for severe sinus tachycardia. Okay, so very, very real world case. And this, this is a real world case. So this really happened. Um, so, and so I, before I go up there, um, I pulled out the data and sure enough, that patient is tachycardic. Um, so the day of concert, it goes up to the 160s, a little bit higher than 160s. And they said sinus tach turned out to be, it, it was sinus tachycardia. Um, and if you go back, you know, day one, so one or two days before, even then he was already tachycardic, little spikes there. So now if you check the temperature at the same time, you plot it, you know, this is all available. So you see it, it almost perfectly correlates. You know, there's a little fever spike and it becomes more tachycardic. The fever breaks and the heart rate goes down. And then this morning or that at the time when I was consulted, he had a fever of 40, almost 42 degrees, 41 and something. So... So the, 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 the CQ attending asked me if, if, if beta blockers would be indicated. And, and fair enough, it's, it, wasn't a, it was not a surgeon, it was, it was a pulmonologist. Um, so what did we recommend? The fellow and me, we recommended what? That's what we did. So we put the cooling blanket on, exactly. And this is what happened, right? So um, you go back, to, I mean, just barely talk about it back in the 90s. So no beta blocker needed, nothing else. Right? This is not a, you don't give a cardiac drug, you just give something which has, it's a, it's a non-cardiac intervention and it fixes the problem. So, and, and in that case, we were wondering, well, if we can, if we can do this now, it, there's an N of one, that's a bad, you know, uh, David Dicek would not chide me for the N of one, don't publish the N of one. Uh, and here just made it onto a slide. Um, so, but what, what if we create, I mean, we have, this was pulled out of Orca and we have lots and lots of data points. So I asked uh, Neil Chatterjee and it's like, well, do you, I mean, because I figured he might have access, but he referred me to someone else since like, oh, we do have access. So that was him. Vikas actually turns out, I knew him from Stanford um, before, and he's, you know, at, at the Children's Hospital. He is uh, in charge of the bioinformatics in, in the Orca and the EPIC database queries. So... So we filled that for patients with had not only vital signs, but some cardiac and our parameter recorded as well. And it turned out then we, we got mostly CCU and CTICU patients, critically ill patients or more or less critically ill. So, and these are all the, the, the parameters we pulled out. So body temperature, heart rate, blood pressures, uh, filling pressures, so CVP, PA diastolic, wedge, and then the cardiac output and the index. And this is from thermal dilution. So I verified this. This is um, the, the numbers that are usually logged are from a thermal dilution catheter, the continuous cardiac output. And then the calculated parameters that we got from, so calculated derived from the numbers that we're being measured are SVR and stroke volume. And then we did an extra, an extra lap um, and we got all the medications too that have been, have been logged around that time the medications and the, and the vital signs were, were recorded. Okay, so, so within six hours of work, they pulled out almost 600,000 data sets. These are not data points. These are like at least, you know, heart rate, blood pressure, and temperature recorded. So 600, almost 600,000 data sets, uh, translating from roughly 9,000 patients. So this is like a huge in number of data, I mean, in, you know, with minimal amount of work. I almost had tears in my eyes when I remember how, much, how long it takes me to get these data. I would never get these data points at the bench. Um, so, um, and these are real world clinical data. 
And here's a little, you know, glimpse what you can get. This is, I'm not going to go through this slide, but, um, you know, you can correlate a lot of vital signs against each other if you want to. Uh, you can plot it, you know, like some trend lines if you if you'd like so to, you know, if that's affected, if the numbers are affected by medications. Um, there's some some interesting correlations going on um let me see if i can get my well you can see for example the 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 blood pressure themselves correlate really well to each other the other thing we're going to go later a little bit into is this the, the pa diastolic and the wedge actually correlate really well you see it right away there's almost like a, a, a linear relationship so a couple of things that pop out right away even if you look at the overall course data so now let's 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 query this big data set and say like, well, you know, we know Starling found it in the dogs. So if you make it warmer, the heart rate goes up. Um, the patient harbor view on the CQ was pretty convincing too, that the heart rate and the temperature was very dependent on each other. So what happens if you just look at 600,000 data sets? You know, it, it, is that still holding true? And it is, it is. So these are 600,000 data, I mean, more or less. Uh, the numbers underneath the line, actually the number of data points, those are not the actual measurements. So no one has a temperature of 197,000 Celsius. It's the, the data point, for example, 36, the, the range of 36 degrees from 36.0 to 36.99. We have 197,000 data points. Uh, at 37, it's 264. So it's a huge you know, huge number. Obviously, it trails off a little bit at the end, so it's a little normal distribution. Um, and then, if you get very to the extremes, there's there's not much. So we kind of limited between the temperature range of 32 to 41. So, but if you see this, there's a, again like a very linear relationship, right? So if you you increase the temperature by one degree, actually you can calculate the slope, it's like 5.0. So you increase the heart rate by five, you go up another degree, it goes up by another five, it goes, you know, you, you increase by another degree, it goes another five. So um, again, like, so that's very similar to the dog hearts, which is like, you know, it was an isolated dog heart. And now you have patients on the ICU with most of them with heart disease, because otherwise they wouldn't have, a, you know, cardiac output and heart rate measurements and everything. And they have the same, relationship, the same relation between uh, temperature and heart rate. So linear thing. So there seems to be something to it, um, which, you know, is also spanning the, the in investigations of time from 1912 all the way to 2020. So if you compare this to other published data, uh, there was one, they're all very recent. So everyone is digging a little bit more into these, these big data sets. So this is one from the uh, Asian national studies. They looked at emergency room patient visits. So in adults, they found the same thing. It's also a correlation. And they found if you go up by one degree, the average heart rate goes up by eight, by seven. Um, and these are 1.2 million data sets plus minus. And there's another study from, from Denmark and Sweden, um, 500,000 data sets, they find 8.3 depending on where we, you know, if you include in our data, if you include the extremes, you get anything between five and six. So this is, a, the ballpark is like anything between five and eight, depending on how sick I guess the patients are, you get this increase. And also again, a very linear, linear trend. So seems to be true for dogs, seems to be true for patients in, in many countries uh, and in many states. So this, this was helpful because it, it kind of validates a little bit our data. You know, I wouldn't be, I would have been very surprised if, you know, with this big scale of data, I would be completely off, but we kind of, you know, the heart rate data that we have fits very well to other data that has been published. Okay. So heart rate, that's not that interesting, right? <laughs> so we want to go to the cardiac output. So what about cardiac output? Um, so again, like our data set. So let's see, we have the data there, right? So you just pull it out. Um, and here is, again, like the numbers are the number of observations. The number is listed on underneath the graph. It's not the actual um, cardiac output and cardiac index, but you see, well, it does ink. So if you warm, if the patient gets warmer, the patient gets more febrile. 
the cardiac output goes up, but not the same way the heart rate, but the heart rate goes straight up linear. So this kind of levels out a little bit, and then at the end kind of dips. So it's, it's, it's definitely not that, you know, that increase that you see with the heart rate. So something else is happening, right? So if you remember, this is now, we have the cardiac output is on top. The index is the below, both in green. Temperature again is like at the, on the x-axis. Um, and now you remember the gray line is the heart rate. So just pull it back in. So the, the heart rate goes up. The cardiac index and the output does not follow the same trend. So something else must be. And we, and we do know, right, cardiac output going back, heart rate times, times stroke volume. So the stroke volume must go somewhere the opposite direction of the heart rate. Otherwise, you, you know, you wouldn't see this trend in the cardiac output. And, and there it is. So this is the stroke. The so blue is the stroke volume now. So if the patient get warmer, your heart rate goes up, well established, but your stroke volume goes down. So the net effect is that the cardiac output is somewhat stable, not really, there's some movement there, but you know, again, like, so the stroke volume and the heart rate kind of diverge. So now you're saying that, like, well, you know, okay, stroke volume, that could be many reasons, as we know. So now this goes back to our cardiac physiology and what we do um, in the ICU all the time. So what about, what about the afterload, right? So stroke volume, especially if you have a, a weak ventricle, ventricle, um, what happens, with, you know, if you, if you crank up the afterload, yeah, of course, the stroke volume goes down. Not, a, you know, this is nothing, nothing new. So, well, what happens to the, to the, to the afterload here in this patient set? Well, it actually goes down. So this is what you would expect, right? So someone become more, can, becomes more septic. We know that usually the blood pressure goes down. So they, the blood pressure, the afterload cannot be the reason why the stroke volume goes down. It cannot be, right? So it, the afterload goes down. What you would expect is that the stroke volume goes up if it was just afterload dependent, but it's the opposite. So you see there's a decrease in the afterload in the, in the, in the, uh, arteria and the SVR. So by that, you would expect the stroke volume going up, but it's not, it's doing the opposite. And this is just the SVR plot. Again, the SVR is, is calculated, but you see the SVR goes down. You would expect the opposite for the stroke volume, but it's not. So, well, okay, preload, same thing, you know, like typical heart failure thing. Okay, the, so, and this is a better, right? This is a better guess, right? So you, you, we talk about someone or people who become patients, who become more septic if you just, you know, if they become warmer. So in septic patients, your first reflex is, oh yeah, they need more volume because, you know, their volume depleted, the preload is down. And, and that actually would make sense, right? So if patients become from the hypothermic, normal thermic, hyperthermic, the preload going down, you know, if there's less preload, then the stroke volume goes down with higher temperature. It makes sense. I mean, that's the assumption. It's logical, but let's say it see if that's true. And there's another big surprise of the data set. So contrary to what you think, you know, that all patients will become febrile. So if you go from the from the left to the right on the on the x-axis, if you come from hyper hypothermia to normal thermia to 37 to you know temperatures to 40, you would think the preload goes down. Well, in this data set, it doesn't. Either they they were you know, intervened upon and maybe they give them a lot of fluid, or maybe it's actually not that relevant. You know, maybe it's not true all the time that the preload drops that dramatically. But regardless, so we look at here the CVP is the bottom one. Uh, and the yellow one is the wedge in the PA diastolic on top. So all these like yellowish um, graphs. All of them, it's not only one, but all of them kind of either stay stable or even maybe going up. So again, like, so that kind of flies in your face for why the stroke volume goes down. So it cannot be really the afterload. And it cannot be the preload either because the preload doesn't really decrease. So, so what is going on? Why is the stroke volume going down in, you know, in a, in a pretty significant way? Um, so, well, let's see what other people have done. And here, now we're going back in time again. And so it, it, you, you get the idea, like all this stuff, you know, that's, 
the cardiac output, which is one, one of the critical concepts in cardiology, it, people have looked at this and you can come across all these big names. So now we're talking about Robert Bruce, you know, if you have ever any put anyone on the treadmill where you have come across this name and he was here too in Seattle. He was one of the first, I think he was the first chairman of the division of cardiology. So, all right, so they, they, they did the real deal. <laughs> so that was from 1966, JCI. Um, and they took healthy men and ex made them exercise at four different levels. And the highest level was so much that only half of the, the, the number of, of, of volunteers kind of completed the, the workload because it was so, so high. Um, and they put, in, put them either in the in normal, normal temperature, you know, acclimatized, uh, acclimatized room or at, at 110 degrees Fahrenheit and make them exercise there. And not only that, so not only like did, did half of the, the people not complete the workload, so, and then four different workloads, so leisurely and a little harder, and then four levels where this people, this really apparently probably collapsed. Um, so they also gave an, a venous catheter into the, in the right atrium, and they also cannulated the brachial artery and put one into the air order. So the real deal. Um, and a mass for oxygen uh, measurements. So... Um, and they injected some dye into the order, sorry, into the, into the RA and then into the order first to measurements of the, you know, a, a dye dilution technique to measure the cardiac, which is, you know, the, you would say the gold standard, because this is not affected by any temperature. There's no, there's no oxygen, you know, saturation they're measuring, which might get affected. So this is a, a dye dilution, maybe thermal dilution, or even fancier than that. So... This is what they did. So healthy adults still. And here's the data. So 1966. Um, so there, there, there are eight graphs, but the main point is, so they, they each, so the, the continuous line is the, the, uh, the data obtained at a lower temperature, the cool room temperature. And the, the dashed lines are the ones at a higher temperature, at 110 degrees. And then you have different workloads. So 7.510 and 12.515 are just in the, the levels of the workload, how they exercise. And on the X actually you have time. So the, the time is maybe not that important. The different levels of exercise are not that important either. Um, but the distinction between the, the dash and the continuous line between the hot and the cooler environments is telling, right? So a cooler environment, again, like this is heart rate is lower. And as you expect, when you exercise people in the, in the hot environment, the heart rate is higher. Okay. Fair, fair enough. And here's the, the stroke volume. So again, like a lot of data points, but we only have two data points here for the temperature. So one hot, one cool. Um, and here's the opposite is true again. So now the, the continuous line, the, the, the black lines, continuous lines are on top. And that's the colder environment, the colder room, cooler room. And whereas the dashed line at 110 degrees with exercise is at the bottom. So the, the stroke volume, when, you, when you're in a hotter environment, the stroke volume is lower. So they found it too. And that's a different method. It's not like, you know, from Orca and, and electronic health record based. This is in, in the laboratory as, as laboratory like as you can, as you get like with, with human subjects. So same thing is true. So Hotter makes your heart rate faster, but drops your stroke volume. Okay. So what now? You could argue, well, you know, just, uh, it's, it's still a patient and there's still, there's a venous system there and there's an arterial system there. Uh, there's pre, it's still preload and afterload. I mean, they measured the central blood volume at that time. Um, so maybe we can do this in a little more organized fashion. One more time, just to look at, you know, stroke volume when you get warmer um, in a more laboratory setting. And now let's go to this guy. That's the lobster. Um, so lobster obviously does not operate at, you know, 37 degrees Celsius. They like a cold. They live in the, you know, North Atlantic Ocean there off the coast of New England. They love it there. Um, so 
one of my favorite publications of all times. Uh, Temperature depends on the cardiac performance in a lobster homer. You always wonder how people pick their research subjects, but um, so um, they they did similar things to what Starling did with the dog hearts in 1912. They also took the lobster heart this time uh, and perfused it, uh, and also changed the temperature. And also, but this this time they not only record the heart rate; they had it like it's almost like a like a like an earthquake like a seismic uh, graph, you know, it, it, they hooked it up, they hooked up the heart uh, to pretty much uh, little bit, you know, little graph that can record not only the, 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 the rate, how it changes, but also how, what the force is. And here's the graph, right? So you hook it up and every time it beats, it gives you a little, you know, peak on the, on the graph, but the more it beats, you know, then obviously the amplitude goes up. So on the on the uh, on the y-axis you have the weight, which is nothing else but the force and the amplitude as well. So this is this is a beautiful graph, right? It's simple, um, but uh, it has a lot of information in there. So as we said, like the, the, the lobster does not operate at thirty-seven degrees. So now you go down to almost zero degrees, almost freezing water, right? Two degrees, and uh, as you see, like at two degrees the beating frequency is less the further you go to the right. So if you warm it up, it beats more frequently. So that's the heart rate. There's again, like a temperature dependence between, uh, a temperature depends on the heart rate. Now, if you look at the, you know, the amplitude, which correlates with the force, it's the opposite, right? So if it's colder, then it beats, slower more slowly but it beats more forcefully and then if you go to the right it gets it gets faster but the, the the force decreases over over and and further and further until it gets you know at 16 degrees it's minimal um and then it drops off then the correlation like uh still falls apart if you just make it warmer it's probably not the the most comfortable temperature for lobster at 22 degrees uh and this is the summary you know again like the heart rate is the top panel uh, across temperature it goes up and then again like if you go too far kind of that relationship falls a little bit apart but the stroke volume goes down so again like you have this divergent thing heart rate going up stroke volume going down it translates into some you know non-linear relationship for the cardiac output in general which is at the bottom all right so you could argue well Again, it's still a heart, right? It's the, it, they, they took a lobster heart and it's still a heart. So you still have the preload, you still have the afterload. So there are a lot of parameters which, you know, affect the stroke volume. Um, so what if we take everything away? So if there was no preload, no afterload and no diastolic filling, right? So then you finally answer the question, what's going on? And so you do single cell measurements in vitro. So there's no diastolic filling. There's no arterial blood pressure. There's no innovation. So the whole heart, this whole system falls apart. I mean, it's not there. So you, if you see an effect, it's, it, it has to be somewhat intrinsic to the cardiomyocyte. Uh, so this is what we did. So here's the, you know, now, now, now we're going to the bench. Um, so there's an incubation chamber and, you know, we have two chambers. You, you pretty much place the, the cells in the middle of these little dishes there. This is just a test run, but you see they can warm that. Down there is an IR, an infrared picture. You know, one is cold, one is warm, but it can change. You know, there's a water bath being hooked up to it. So you can change the temperature of the cells while you're, while you're recording them. And then you just take, you know, the microscope and you take this, just, you know, picture, but you take a video, how they beat. And then once they beat and you have the video, you can analyze the video and see how frequently they beat and how much they beat. So very simple. And if you wanna, you know, this is what you usually see um, on the bottom right. Um, this is if you fix the cell and make it, st you stain it with, you know, the red is the sarcomeres, the green are the, the mitochondria. So this is, you know, this is a nicer version, but these are the cardiomyocytes. So you have plenty of those in, in your heart. Okay, so let's see. So now comes the quiz. Um, Okay. 
So I'm going to dim this down a little bit. So, so there are two, so the same, same cardio set, okay, same dish. And one is recorded at temperature one on the left, and then the right one, same dish, but recorded, you know, you, you just change the temperature and then you, you record it again. So let's do the test <laughs> and people can shout. Um, so number one, how could, I guess two, two things, how quickly they beat. And then you get a bonus point if you also know if the amplitude goes up or down or like changes, you know, which one, so which one beats faster and uh, which one has the, greater fractional shortening amplitude, whatever you want to call it. Um, so maybe um, it's subtle, it's subtle. So, okay, so get a first impression. We're gonna zoom in a little bit on, on one. So we're gonna zoom in on this area. Okay, let's try this again. All right. Hold. So any idea? Oh, maybe maybe you can start with which one is beating faster. Okay, one is faster. Okay, so now so okay, fair. Okay, um, so now the more tricky question is which one beats beats more strongly? I mean, like where you know, two, yes, no. Okay, let's see. Yeah, right. So, so kind of fits, right? So you said the left one is beating faster, but not as strongly, and the, the right one is beating more slowly, but you know with a bigger amplitude. I mean, and this is like, I mean, you can get the if you go to extremes, like you know, you go to forty degrees, you, most of the time you often fry the cells, but you can still even then it's more impressive. Even I mean, they beat really fast, and almost yeah, there's no amplitude anymore. They're kind of close to flickering. And if you go to 20 degrees, it's, I didn't pick that at 20 degrees because it beats so slowly that you just have to wait forever. But then obviously it becomes more obvious. So yes, so even right, even in a world um, where there's no chamber, um, this seems to be true. So if you can, you know, you can track it the same way again, like what Starling did with dark hearts. You just kind of track the temperature and you track the heart rate just by counting. How often this says so pretty much what we did right now here. Uh, you see there's a perfect correlation right now. So the temperature goes down, the heart rate goes, or the beating rate goes down, the temperature goes back up, the beating rate goes back up, and at some point, you know, the cell stops though. So this is just the heart rate, but if you, so now this is very similar to the plot from the lobster, right? So, but now you have a human cardiomyocyte. So no heart, no lobster heart, no dog heart. This is the human cardiomyocyte. And you kind of, you start with a warmer temperature and then you cool it down. And the same thing is, so this is non-continuous, by the way. This is not like 80 seconds. There's, you know, little breaks in between each temperature step. But the red ones, uh, the warmer stages, and then you go to the, to the more to the right. This is where you just kind of record at colder temperatures. And it kind of, you see it in the, we color coded the, the tracings. Um, so, and in, in very similar again what we found earlier um, with the lobster hearts. So if it's warmer, they beat a little faster, but the, this is amplitude this time, but the amplitude is, is low. And if you cool it down, they beat more slowly, but the amplitude goes up. Now, the, the interesting thing is, so contraction goes up. What is that? Oh, sorry, did I mix it up? Well, the amplitude, so there's, it, it's, it's the whole excursion, right? So contraction goes up. So this is like the, the up is contraction, and then it relaxes again and goes down. But there is a little biphasic thing. It's like there's a little shake. So you see in the video, they kind of like over, overshoot a little bit, and then they kind of settle again. Um, but yeah. Um, so that there's one interesting aspect about this, because you do see, so right, you can not only like how often they beat, but you can also see the slope how they contract and how it relaxes. And they're actually kind of, if you cool it down, 
that slope gets actually lower. So it gets the kinetics slow down. So it, it contracts it more slowly and it relaxes more slowly as well, right? So the slope is not as steep anymore if you go from left to right. And that's an interesting thing because yeah, you, the amplitude goes up. So the force is stronger, but the kinetics itself slow down, which then makes you wonder, you know, we do a lot of measurements by echo uh, and we, we always correlate the, the, the velocity that it matches the force. Uh, but that would argue a little bit against it. So, but the velocity actually, you know, decreases, but the force goes up. So there might be something to it, which we, you know, we should think about because like necessarily, you know, the velocity, higher velocities does not necessarily mean, and at least for the, for the individual cardiomyocyte that the force goes the same way. It goes in, it's an inverse. So if it slows down, it gets colder, you know, everything slows down, velocity of contraction and relaxation decreases, but the force goes up. All right, so a little summary here, like in the middle, not quite in the middle, we're getting closer to the to some end. Um, so the contraction rate and contraction amplitude are inversely related in response to temperature change. And again, like the, the data points and the measurements and the investigations go back, you know, back to the early 1900s. Um, and this inverse relation, uh, relation is observed in vivo in patients of our data, like the big, large EPIC data and ORCA data, in isolated hearts, different species, and in single cells as well. Uh, and the net effect is a relatively constant cardiac output, right? So if you, one goes, you know, the heart rate goes up, but the stroke when it goes down, then you overall have a relatively constant cardiac output across a wide temperature spectrum. Um, and interestingly, so this is a very, right, so how it, it diverges is very much representing the typical, or like some patients on the end of each spectrum, like the healthy athlete's heart and the, you know, systolic heart failure who just presents the patient who presents with, with resting heart rate elevation. So just to keep that in mind. So anyway, on the, on the side, side conclusion, it's like the, our own EHR system is like really is a is a resource which can be readily tapped. I mean, there, there's lots and lots of data at it, and we just you know it's 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 at it's it's at our fingertips. So, very quick. So let's how why right? I mean, how is this inverse relationship? How is it? Why is it happening? So if you think about so this is you know we extrapolate now a little bit. Um, if you think about like temperature change is more or less you change the environmental metabolic parameters, how the heart operates, it's nothing else, right? So you change, it gets, makes it warmer and colder. So there is some metabolic, you know, parameters being changed and that changes how the heart beats. Um, so you can ask, well, this, what's the link between metabolism and cardiac contract, contractility? There's obviously, you know, it's in every physiology book. It's like, well, yeah, of course, the heart is a metabolic organ because it does so much work. And so there's a huge amount of on, on mechanical, mechanical work being done. And yeah, that takes a lot of energy. Right? So, and you can see it in, uh, I mean, this is just a, a snapshot, but lots of publications. I mean, all reviews, the heart requires a large amount of energy to sustain contraction, right? This, um, this uh, Gary Lopashuk, Rong Tian was on, one of them here, and, and Dale Abo, and um, and he knows all those folks as well. So, right, I mean, contraction takes a lot of energy, right? That's the reason why it's such a organ with such high metabolic level. Is that really true, right? Or is it the other way around? Does the heart, you know, do a lot of mechanical work because it's metabolically very active? <laughs> So you turn it upside down. So that changes a few things. Um, and again, like we're going to go a little back in time, not, not, not to the 1910s right now, but again, people have looked at this before and they, this idea is not entirely new. Um, so this is from Archibald Hill. I think he got the Nobel Prize in the 1920s already for his work on muscle contraction. But he was always haunted by this heat release and really had a hard time in the 1920s to separate the heat release from the mechanical work because it happens, I mean, right? You're talking about milliseconds. Like 
if you want to separate those two and you want to separate the metabolic step from our from a mechanical step you have to be really fast and it took him a while and like to and this is from 1958 i think um so they they took a muscle fiber from the frog sartorius and uh and uh, pretty much stimulated it and then had i mean they really developed this apparatus over 30 years how to really measure like tiny little changes in temperature and you know tiny little contractions um as fast as you could i mean as as quickly as as soon as you could and um so the heat release is like i marked this one as a and b depending on what i said what what tonicity what osmolarity the solution had is a and b but c is the graph where they measure the contraction right so there is a there's a problem here right so the contraction happens significantly after there's a metabolic process like after heat is being released so and you say like wow it's like 30 milliseconds it's nothing well in, in terms of a, a muscle fiber that is like a long time right so you have there's a heat release and then it is a while and then at some point the contraction happens if you think the atp and everything on the on the muscle fiber you know would be causing the heat release well then it should be instantaneous you know the, the contraction should be happening right away but it's not and if you they even correct it for the apparatus because there's some heat loss in the apparatus so if you correct that then you get to line d and you get even earlier almost like immediately after the shock like milliseconds after the shock you have a heat release and then 50 milliseconds 60 milliseconds later the muscle contracts so there is an initial what they called or this the muscle's heat production starts considerably earlier than in shortening so in the in people who, again like has this have discussed it people had discussed this before but they say these findings strengthen strengthen the previous conclusion that chemical reactions triggered by a stimulus precede the mechanical response so you have some metabolic step happening first and then everything else follows and there's another study in 1972 by gibbs i mean there, there are many studies out there but again like these the changes are subtle and again like the same thing there's a uh, you know the the two graphs the contraction force on the top panel the heat release on the bottom pen there's a huge increase they measure it in microcalories obviously during the contraction there's a lot of energy being um uh released but if you look very carefully at the beginning same thing so there's a little bump it almost looks like a p wave you know on the on the ekg but sure enough it's right there right so they have an energetic release step first and then everything else follows and there you know there are many many studies out there it's mostly on not necessarily cardiac muscle but on all muscle so they call it the activation phase so conclusion now we kind of come to the big conclusion it's very short so a metabolic energy thresholding event triggers the mechanical contraction and that what does it mean so i stole this, this slide also from from our uh, research conferences so the concept of a metabolic trigger for cardiac contractions uh, what does it do well it should aid our understanding right of cardiac function in, in, not only in disease but also you know in in health and it can explain why heart rate and contraction are linked as we know they are you know in almost every scenario in the you know in our cardiac uh, clinical life we, we we notice this so it would also explain why if you give drugs that actually aim you know to change the metabolism such as beta blockers they are classic beta one beta two and beta three are all the adrenal receptors and beta three i always say there's like the classic which almost no one knows is very similar to beta to the other beta receptors but it sits on brown fat it's the classic stimulant receptor for activating heat <laughs> you know it doesn't get better than it. so a beta three receptor does nothing else but releasing heat or turning on the energy turnover um and this goes back the last point goes back to the harborview patient right so brady arrhythmias or tachyarrhythmias you don't have to necessarily you know it's it's not necessarily a a cardiac problem right it, it might be just an environmental systemic problem in this case you can treat it you know through external conditioning 
no need for beta blockers. And I would like to thank uh, a lot of people. It has been, you know, quite, I mean, over, over the time, over the years, it has been, you know, this research project has expanded. Uh, Vikas, obviously, because he was very responsive and very helpful for the, for the ORCA data pool. Christine Fong is one of his bioinformaticians, who is also very helpful. And Una and Kevin actually provided some funding. You know, the initial pilot fund, yeah, you might not even remember. It was not much, which is good. So you can do a lot of this research. Actually, you don't need that much money, although Rob, they didn't say this. So you always need money. Um, Sarah, actually, with the TT image, I didn't show today. Stanford, uh, Alex was my co post fellow, and we did a lot of you know, IPSC work there. And some of the videos date back to those days. Um, and uh, Nate Hübsch actually was at that time at UCSF, and he provided us and was also very helpful with the, with the software to analyze the um, contractions. And that was this. I'm happy to take questions. That's probably the most interesting grand rounds I've ever seen. I have to say, that's a beautiful uh, uh, example of a physician scientist bedside to bench to be back to bedside. I, I, I'm just blown away. It has Congratulations. to be, it has to be true. <laughs> Thank you. Gerhard, thank you very much. Uh, know, yeah. That was very interesting. I was wondering, you know, while beta blockers, at least in the short, maybe perhaps medium term, are negative inotropes, do you think what you've discussed, do you think that mechanism has a role in the reverse remodeling that, that we see with uh, long-term beta blockers? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, speculation, right? I mean, this is all an open field. I don't, I don't know. But you could you can easily you know if there's a link between metabolism, temperature, inflammation. You know, inflammation is it's already in the word, right? Inflammation carries. You know, there, there is almost like a caloric uh, comment in the in the word of inflammation. So if you think that plays any role in heart failure, which you know there's more and more data coming up, the inflammation, especially chronic inflammation, might be one of the main determinants. Then yeah, I mean, so the reason why beta blockers work might be because, you know, this extra metabolic step it might be just increased enough actually if you put the brakes on. But yeah, so that might not only be an acute, you know, might not only lead to an acute change in the contraction, but also in the long term to changes in architecture, you know, tissue architecture, and it, what is called as remodeling. Yeah, I mean, I don't know, but it's it's very intriguing to assume that is true as well. Greg, yeah. A really fascinating talk. Um, do you want to uh, wager some comments on environmental temperature change over time uh, and how that may affect what we see they're presenting clinically or sort of at the population level? Yeah, I mean, I, I scan a lot of those publications over the years. Um, there are, it, I think, two two camps who just kind of look at, you know, it changes acutely, like environmental change, you know, outside temperatures that people live. And, you know, how this, you know, if you, they look at acute change, like for example, a heat, a heat wave that hits, you know, a certain region in the summer or like a cold snap in the winter and see, you know, and track how many and what the mortality does. So that's one. The other camp actually does it more long-term and say like, you know, what's the, how does the climate, um, you know, and you live in, you know, does that have any effect on your on your cardiac health and disease? So, in terms of camp number one, um, as far as I know, it goes up and down. Um, I haven't found too much like there's a, you know, for example, that the heat heat wave always, you know, increases your, or let's put it this way, the heat almost always like leads to heat wave almost almost leads to increased mortality and the same with a cold snap as well like if you go to again like new england and you have a you know a brutal winter there I mean, you can track the mortality after those events or during those events goes up which it might be not that that you know exciting because that's what you would think um i think the more interesting thing is like what happens if you know, if you track of where people live, you know, does that have, and, and, and the CDC has actually a very interesting map, right? So you can, you can find the, the regional mortality, you can 
plotted onto the map of the U.S. and track it for anything. I mean, heart disease, cancers, anything you can imagine. Um, but I, I would suggest, you, I mean, you can do this within a minute, right? You see, pull out the seat and you do it. And it's like, either you believe or you don't, but there is almost like a clear correlation, like with a humid, hot climate more in the Southeast, you call the Rust Belt, but the Rust Belt is also like, there is something else going on in the Rust Belt because the climate is very, very different. It, it, it's more humid and hot. And then if you go to Colorado, and Utah, yes, they have a different population to, from the genetic point too, but the mortality drops. So, and if you plot it, there's, I never done the correlation coefficient, but I'm, it would be an easy thing to do. So maybe we want to do this. And I'm pretty sure there is some link to that, like where the temperature, the environmental temperature where you live in every day for years and decades might have an effect on, on heart disease. Yeah, no, I, I think it's super interesting because you can think about the effect of large changes in temperature, right, or climate, um, but you're really showing data about real changes happening with, you know, one degree or half a degree of oh, yeah. temperature change. Yeah, and right, I mean, yes, I mean, we only do these extremes because it's easier to, I mean, it's, it's easier to draw the conclusion, but yes, I mean, but the question also is if you, right, if you have only a modest degree in change, but for a really long, long time, how does that affect? And that goes pretty much to Ginoza's question too. So beyond the acute effects, what are the long-term effects? And that's like a completely open field, but there's, I think there's lots and lots of circumstantial evidence that it does play a role. And yeah. Really nice talk. Uh, I was curious if in your patient data and in, I guess your your review of a lot of the the literature, if you've looked at, um, how that temperature shifts correlate with uh, pH for the patients. Because um, I think a lot about as you get hotter, you have more protons dissociating, protons compete with calcium yeah. and reduce contractility. So I, I would kind of wonder if, if some of what you see on the extremes could be explained by kind of dynamics of the pH of the system. I mean, I, I, we didn't pull out the data for, uh, from our orcas, but that's a good point. Um, we didn't pull out the data from, I mean, we didn't have any lab data from the, the data that we pulled from the clinical database. I do know though, for the bath solutions, you know, for the, for the in vitro experiments that the pH there was controlled. Um, so yeah, that's a good point. Um, you might wanna see if, can take that data out too. On on a on a related note, though, I mean, if we talk about lab numbers, um, so we we also looked at you know the Fick equation, <laughs> the Fick equation like to cal calculate cardiac output, but the Fick equation breaks down uh, for similar reasons because you know once you get warmer and hotter, your overall metabolism, the systemic metabolism of your of your body changes, right? You have a higher oxygen contraction. So even if your if your cardiac output, and that's a little speculation because there's really not much data out there. But whatever I could find, like in February patients, you think your I mean your overall oxygen uptake and consumption increases with the increase in metabolism. Even if the cardiac output would stay the same, your Fick equation right would probably change because your overall saturation, venous, you know, central venous oxygen probably drops down because you just extract more oxygen because your metabolism goes up. So even, even if it kept the cardiac upward completely stable, you probably would see a change in, in the oxygen saturation. So in some bottom line is, I think you have some changes in metabolism or like in the, in the, in lab parameters with fever, as you said, um, and you have to take that into account. Yeah, I agree. So it's a good point. Maybe you want to take some, maybe you're going to, you'll be able to pull some data more, some lab data as well. So there are a couple of questions. Uh, that, uh, Jim Kirkpatrick says, uh, asks, uh, or says, phenomenal organization of the talk uh, from big data to cells. What role might fever or hypothermia play in the process of cardiac death? Oh, so uh, great question, Jim. Um, that goes also back to an, an incidental finding. I think we did... You know, it was back at Stanford doing the postdoc <laughs> when we had a cardiomyocyte, a single cardiomyocyte, and um, we accidentally heated up too quickly and too much. <laughs> um, and it was like a classic mistake, right? Because you just hook up the wrong water bath, 
uh, and you had the flow too high. Um, but on the other hand, it was it was a great finding. So what happens is uh, it started being really fast and then even faster. And we had a calcium. So we had a calcium uh, indicator as well. So we could see the calcium waves. So you see the how the wave goes through, you know, and goes faster and faster and, and develops faster, the, the calcium wave and goes through. And at some point it started to, the cardiomyocytes started to fibrillate. And the whole calcium signal was exactly what you think. It was like all over the place. And it didn't start from one area, you know, but usually, uh, usually a very coordinated wave follows from one area of the, you know, the cardiomyocyte and it follows through to the other end. So at some point the calcium occurred and came in from all over the place. And that's actually when the, the myocytes started to fibrillate. So we said, oh, that's bad. And obviously it died didn't last long, but it might be, and we never followed up on that, but I always kept that in mind because if that is true, you know, that, you know, maybe an overstimulation of your metabolism actually leads to, a, you know, um, a disorganized contraction, which is nothing else, for example, like a cardiac death. I don't know if Jim related, um, meant, meant the V-fib arrest or VT, but there could be, there could be, a, there could be a link. We're almost out of time. Uh, Jim's second question was: um, Are these are there studies using echo strain at different temperatures? Um, there are. There are some echo. I did find some echo studies. They're mostly in the OR for different temperatures. Where the you know before the surgery is being started, mm -hmm. um, they they looked. You know, the patient got cooled down during the, you know, in, during the induction or like before actually the, the incision and they, they ch looked at stroke volume, um, how it changes. I'm, I, I'm not sure. I, there might be some out there. Uh, there might be some out there. Did, again, like there are a few studies and very limited number of patients where they looked at, you know, echocardiographic changes with temperature change, but I'm not quite sure about the strain, but it might be worth looking at, obviously. And then last, last question from Mel Thompson, real quickly. Uh, was there an opt optimal temp balancing heart rate and contraction? I assume that the cardiac output. There is, yeah, exactly. So, uh, but good point. So it's, it's, it stays overall relatively stable, as we said, like, but there is one, I think, I have to go back, it's around 30, interestingly, around 37. <laughs> so, yes, good point. Makes you wonder, you know, why it is at 37. But that's a whole, that's a whole story for a different talk. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Gerhard. That's really good. Thanks. Thank you.